Hi, welcome to Audiobook Academy. This is a self-paced audiobook. There's no need to keep an eye on things. Just pay attention. Thank you for taking the time to listen. This is a book summary of Life Lessons. Two experts on death and dying teach us about the mysteries of life and living. By Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. What I've learned in life. Two death and dying experts educate us on life's mysteries. According to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. When it comes to life lessons, life lessons tells us not to put it off any longer. It provides us with ideas to help us find greater peace and understanding. It teaches us 14 life lessons, both practical and spiritual, to help us gain a better grasp of the world around us. On death and dying author Elizabeth Kubler-Ross died in 2004 at the age of 89. The final book she planned to pen was going to be about life and living rather than death. As she saw it, we can only live fully by completing the unfinished business we've been carrying around with us. He wanted to share what he had learned from people who were on the edge of life, as he calls it. The dying, he asserts, are the best teachers because they have a clear perspective on life itself. What follows is a brief summary of the author's observations on the universality of the problems we face as human beings. There are 14 lessons in all, both practical and spiritual. Their stories are based on the real-life experiences of people who have been in similar situations and have dealt with these problems. They also talk about how having the opportunity to work with people like that has shaped their outlook. As a guide, the book focuses on the importance of being true to oneself, as well as the importance of valuing others. In the end, it examines the lessons we can take away about surrender, forgiveness, and happiness. When you receive a terminal diagnosis, life doesn't end, this is when it begins. When we accept that we are all going to die, we come to terms with the fact that we are living in the here and now. Since there is no such thing as a later, we must live in the present moment. To be alive is one thing, but it's another to truly feel alive. The dying remind us of the importance of savoring every moment of every day. The problem is that in order to get there, we have to go through a lengthy process of education, many of which are extraordinarily challenging. Despite this, attempts to understand them can be a rewarding experience. Authenticity, relationships, and fear are three of the lessons we'll focus on today. Discover what the authentic works of art of Michelangelo have to teach us about authenticity, as well as how fear, while it may not stop death, can keep us from living our lives to the fullest. Finally, we'll talk about why relationships provide us with the most meaningful means of discovering love, learning, and growing. Getting to know the real person. In the midst of our many roles, experiences, and circumstances, who are we as individuals? That part of us that doesn't get lost with age, disease, or circumstance is what Kubler-Ross believes. Every one of us comes into this world with a certain level of authenticity that we must carry with us throughout our lives and into death. Finding our true selves necessitates letting go of the things that aren't truly us, as those facing life-threatening illnesses teach us. In every situation, we're the one responsible for it. Kessler illustrates his point with an example from his own life. To make the most of his time away, he would wake up early every morning to squeeze in as much as possible into each day. He was exhausted when he finally made it back to his hotel room late at night. He came to terms with the fact that his getaways were actually a source of stress for him. As a result, he reflected on how he would spend his time if no one were watching. Instead of staying up all night partying, he planned to sleep late and take it all in slowly. He would also spend more time relaxing on the hotel veranda, reading a book, or doing nothing at all, as he had done before. Having to play the enthusiastic vacationer wasn't something he was looking forward to. All of this had been done because Kessler thought it was the right thing to do. The more he thought about it, the more he realized that playing by the rules he set for himself would make him happy. By asking ourselves what we would do if no one else was looking, he challenges us to gain insight into our own behavior and to break out of our comfort zones and try new things. Making these changes could teach us a valuable lesson. If you say you would lie, you probably do not feel safe telling the truth, Kessler suggests. Incredibly, we live our lives according to what we think is right, rather than based on what is truly in our hearts. In order to feel more connected to ourselves and others, we need to be more authentic. In the past, Kubler-Ross was awarded the Favorite Professor Award by her students. When the news was first made public, her co-workers were supportive but kept quiet about it. A bouquet of flowers was left at her desk at the end of the day. Jealous as hell, congratulations anyway, it read on the card, which was sent by a co-worker. Kubler-Ross knew right then and there that she could rely on this individual and admired him for being so genuine. 
he was able to make her feel safe because he was himself. The key is to discover our truest selves and to recognize others' genuine selves. During a question and answer session, Renaissance artist Michelangelo explained how he came up with works like the Pieta and David. He went on to say that in his mind's eye, the statue was already housed within the unfinished marble block. With each chisel stroke, he revealed what had been hidden beneath the marble's surface. Our truest selves are hidden deep within each of us, just waiting to be discovered. No one else has ever experienced the world quite the way that I have, the dying woman told Kessler. And there will be no one else who ever will either. For as long as I can remember, there has never been another me. All of us can agree on this point. We can only truly appreciate our uniqueness when we recognize our deepest, most authentic self. The best teachers are the ones you already have. We learn about ourselves and how to love and be loved by others through our relationships. The following are three stories that shed light on relationships, according to the authors. Sadly, at the age of 44, this woman lost her husband to a heart attack, which is the subject of the first story. She recalled the last time they had spent time together that evening. It was a nondescript journey. They had a simple meal together and then stayed up until 9 p.m. watching television. When he complained that his stomach was inflamed and needed some rest, he took an antacid and went to bed early. She kissed him goodnight, wished him a good night's sleep, and promised to join him in the morning when he was feeling better. He was fast asleep when she went to bed. Her husband had died in his sleep of a heart attack the day after she woke up. Never take anyone or anything for granted again after this heartbreaking experience. In every relationship, there will be lasts, as they say. In retrospect, this woman said that she viewed her marriage to her husband as a gift that she would only be able to enjoy for a short period of time. She's come to believe that this holds true for everyone she meets now. As a result, she is able to be more present for others and fully enjoy every moment. As we reflect on our lives, it's important to remember that we tried our best to be fully present during each moment. In the second lesson, we are reminded that not all relationships are meant to last. Consider whether or not there are any gaps in our relationships before we can move forward. Relationships that are successful and complete don't have to last a lifetime. The authors describe James, a man who was adamant that every romantic relationship be successful. He felt like a failure when his two-year relationship with Beth came to an end, even though he and Beth both agreed that it wasn't the right fit for the long term. He was distraught, angry, and hurting all at the same time. They ran into each other by chance and began to reminisce. It was never brought up that they should get back together. Instead, they talked about how much they had gained from the experience of getting to know one another better. As a result of their time together, they both agreed that they would be better people in future relationships. As a result, James was able to see the relationship as a success rather than a failure. In the third lesson, we learn to accept love in all its forms. Hillary had spent the previous few years undergoing cancer treatments and was on her fourth hospitalization. Friends Vanessa and Vanessa's husband, Jack, were always close to her. Jack was saddened by the fact that Hillary had yet to find a significant other, given her circumstances. When Hillary had a lot of visitors one evening, Jack reevaluated his views on love. Watching the throngs of people gathered around Hillary, Jack couldn't help but feel envious of the outpouring of affection directed toward her. To his shock and disbelief, he discovered just how many people adored Hillary. I can't believe all of these people are here to see me. Hillary exclaimed later that night. I had no idea you all cared so much about me. We can learn from Hillary's story that love doesn't have to be romantic or special. Love and being loved entail learning to love oneself completely and remaining open to receiving love in any form. It is the opinion of the authors that we often expect too much from our partners in love. We may hope that others can fix us, lift our spirits, or bring us lasting happiness. We're made to feel like we're a piece of a puzzle that's incomplete without the help of someone else. However, this fairy tale thinking can lead us to avoid taking personal responsibility for our own happiness or finding solutions to our problems. We must love without pretense if we want to be whole. Love has a way of taking on a life of its own when we let go of our preconceived notions about the future and how things should be. We can't control where it goes, and it doesn't care what we want it to do. Let go of your old stories and allow love to take you to beautiful places you never imagined possible for yourself. While fears cannot delay death, they can keep us from living our lives fully. The ultimate fear confronts those who are dying. Death is a possibility for everyone, but it is a certainty for those who are nearing the end of their lives. Realizing there is nothing left to fear or lose brings surprising relief and comfort to patients on the verge of death. Rather than focusing on the things we fear, 
we should instead focus on the fear itself. An effective early warning mechanism is fear. There are times when fear tells us to be on the lookout for danger. Without fear's protection, we wouldn't be able to last long. However, even when there is no danger, we still feel a sense of dread. Despite the fact that we can feel fear, it can weaken our spirits if we don't deal with the source of that fear. False evidence appearing real, F-E-A-R, is a useful acronym for this type of fear. Fear has tremendous power if it is not confronted, but we can lessen its influence by confronting our fears head on. Consider Troy's case. For the previous three years, Troy had been afflicted with an autoimmune deficiency disorder. He was able to function physically, but his fear kept him from fully engaging with the world around him. They kept saying that Troy was more powerful than his fears and that he would ask him to face them. Take your worst fear to lunch, and you'll discover that it doesn't have the power over you that you've given it. During the time Troy was unemployed, he was approached by a woman who needed a caregiver for her elderly mother. Terminally ill and wheelchair bound after a stroke, Jackie was unable to communicate. Her fear of death and being alone was palpable when Troy looked into her eyes. Troy was intimately familiar with these anxieties, as they were his own. His acceptance of the position was despite the fact that he felt unqualified and terrified of the responsibilities that lay ahead. Stepping up and confronting his own fears, he decided to help this stranger. Troy was Jackie's full-time employee and close friend. Troy held her hand the day before she died, felt her fear and calmed her by telling her to face it. Troy used compassion and love to overcome his fear. He was of the opinion that fear can be dispelled simply by making a conscious effort to approach it. The takeaway here is that we can't have a full life if we're constantly afraid. In addition, once we've overcome our fears, we may discover a whole new world waiting for us. In the end, we can more easily come to terms with the fact that our lives will come to an end when we examine these lessons from the edge of life. However, we also become more cognizant of the present moment. You may have heard that the world will continue if a baby is born at some point in time. In the same way, we're given a new day of life each time we get out of bed. As a result, we should pause and consider the last time we lived fully in the moment. How often the authors were reminded of this when they heard dying people say they just wanted one more look at the stars or the ocean before they passed away. You only get one chance to live. That's how they sum up their life lessons. The life you've been given won't be something you get to do again. Make the most of the time you have left with your family and friends before it's too late. See what I mean? Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Please don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. See you in next audiobook.